Okay, we're back with more Shadowrun Hong Kong. From Kindly Shang to Dystopia, Subject, Urgent Task. Little birds have been whispering in my ear about an urgent and high paying run. Steel Arm Lou, <coughs> a red pole, managed, <coughs> managed to get his hands on information concerning a prototype laser weapon in development by Ares Asia Holdings. For years, the Yellow Lotus and the Red Dragon have been locked in a cold war. Despite this, we remain evenly matched. Neither one of us can attack the others without being exposed to devastating reprisals. Lou wants to change this, and he has a plan. Rather than strike directly, Lou intends to aim external forces at the Red Dragon, specifically Knight Errant. <coughs> he intends to frame a white paper fan named Golden Fong, making it appear that the Red Dragon have been bribing Ares researchers for classified data. Two leading drone... <coughs> And energy weapons researchers have recently transferred from London to Hong Kong and are running the project. Uh, doctors Taylor and Horningham were respected in Europe, but in Hong Kong they remain unknown quantities. They're untrusted <coughs> and therefore are considered untrustworthy. Perfect targets, in other words. We will provide data that will make it look as if the researchers were contacted by Golden Fong and made quite a bit of money, <coughs> but grew tired of the arrangement. Transfer the data, the attached data, the attached files to a data ship. The files are, bu are bundled with the worm program, which will auto-execute when inserted into appropriate systems. <coughs> you need not bring a decker, though one may be helpful. You will need to plant data <coughs> in the visitor's recording system. The camera systems in Hortingham and Taylor's lab. Financial data is, been, is to be transferred to Dr. Taylor's personal terminal. That in and itself <coughs> will not be enough to ensure night air and involvement. However, planting the data is only the first part of your task. This is where a heavier touch will be required. You will also need to steal the prototype laser weapon. There is a GPS tracking device attached to it, which Lou will plant uh, deep in Red Dragon territory. <coughs> the apparent theft of a prototype weapon by a disgruntled triad member should convince Ares to dispatch overwhelming force against the Red Dragon dealing them a vicious blow. As a note, Lou does not care what, what becomes of the laser weapon. If you wish to sell it or keep it, feel free. <coughs> I have also attached a map of your extraction route from the building. During the facility's expansion in 2052, Ares Asia was forced to extend their uh, foundations deep into the island. They drove piles <coughs> through the former site of the, of the central MTR station which partially collapsed during the Deilu Bay earthquake of 2044. Practically, <coughs> this means that you can exit through the basement directly onto the new MTR line through Central. With any luck, you can be, be gone without anyone knowing how. Unfortunately, this route is heavily alarmed, so you will be forced to go in the front door. If you can con the front desk, you should have no problem. The facility is both an office and a residence. <coughs> So strange people come and go, coming and going at odd hours is not unusual. If you're not up to the f too fast talk, however, be prepared to shoot your way in. Lou does not care if you're loud or quiet, but a word of caution. He came by all this information via the loose lips of one of the research team. <coughs> other fixers know of this job. Move fast and you are guaranteed success. But there are definitely other shadow runners with an eye on your prize. Take the run. Very well, Steel Arm Lou sends his regards and bids you a good fortune and plentiful ammunition. The dramatic kit. Don't die, Dystopia. Our arrangement has been very profitable so far, and I would hate to lose them. <coughs> restaurant job. From Kalishang to Dystopia. Subject, restaurant job. One of the things I've learned over the years is that even the rich and powerful have annoyances. Thorns in their sides, if you will. No one is without troubles. The rich just have different ways of solving them. The client for this run has grown tired of one particular thorn in his side. Shang Sing Roaster. <coughs> Rooster. Low. Low is a red pole for one of the smaller triads here in Hong Kong. The 289s. Or the Easy Money Gang. If you prefer. <coughs> Despite the 289s small stature, Low's uh, illegal activities have managed to damage the client's profit profits. Mr. Johnson would like you to help him show Low the error of his way. <coughs> Lo takes an evening every few months to dine at the Shangri-La restaurant in Aberdeen. If you weren't aware, the Shangri-La is an elite establishment serving primarily corporate clientele from Woxing Incorporated. Because of this, it's not unusual for diner, 
for diners to bring bodyguards or assistants with them. In Lowe's case, he brings a particular brutish enforcer known as the Talon, and undoubtedly feels well protected. You are going to prove just how wrong he is in this regard. <coughs> you are to kidnap Rost Rooster Lou. So long as he is alive and in relative good health, all options are on the table. While keeping the run quiet uh, would make things easier for Mr. Johnson. No one will shed too many tears over a few dead child thugs. <coughs> the client has arranged an exit via boat. So long as you can get load from the interior to the restaurant's dock, the client will handle everything else. Despite being a red pole, Lowe is a tactician, not a fighter. Don't expect him to put up much of a fight. The Talon, on the other hand, is as nasty as they come. Be careful about how you confront him, <coughs> or things may go very badly. Take the run. I've let the client know you've accepted the job. By the time you arrive in at the Shangri-La, the boat to get you out will be waiting. On to Shang and Josephine. <coughs> From Gobert <coughs> to Dystopia. Subject, on to Shang and Josephine. Hey Seattle, I think I can add a little context to that thing between Auntie and uh, Josephine Sang. You know, the thing that makes Auntie hit the uh, sauce and talk revenge. This is a combo of stuff I heard and stuff I put together myself, so your mileage may vary. For years, the Yellow Lotus acted as tax collectors within the Walled City. <coughs> Since the Walled City was built by Josephine Sang and the Yellow Lotus was run by Auntie Chang, they must have had a working business relationship for a while at least. From what Knight you told me, he was uh, her favorite. You got that right. Auntie was uh, known as a real up-and-comer back then. She was on the fast track to be, to be the next Yellow Lotus 438. That's a big deal gig, <coughs> Seattle. Money and power galore. Now you need to know that there were a lot of triad and corpse doing biz in the world city. All sorts of stuff. Sometimes they work together nicely and sometimes people get bloody. The way that I heard it, Auntie came up with uh, some sort of grand plan to consolidate business in the World City. The power would be split between the Yellow Lotus and the Sangs Company, and everyone else <coughs> would get cut out. If a plan worked, Auntie would race in the Lotus like nobody's business, and Josephine Sang would make long bank. <coughs> there was a catch, though. <coughs> in order for the plan to work, both women would need to jump through a lot of hoops. There'd be street-level maneuvering and power plays on Auntie's side and blackmail and negotiations on the corporate level from Josephine Sang. My info gets sketchy here. From what I've uh, pieced together, Sang went behind Auntie's back and took her plan to her boss, a uh, 438 named Long, Wong Lun Fat. They cut kindly out of her own plan. <coughs> Why'd Sang do that? My guess is that she saw Auntie as some sort of threat. People in the know say that Wong Lun Fat is weak and greedy. She can be manipulated if her palm remains well greased. Long story short, power was consolidated in the World City, just like Auntie Plan, only she didn't wind up getting any of it. Her climb up the Lotus Ladder came to an abrupt halt. She's still a straw sandal, just like she was before Sang backstabbed her, and now she's <coughs> stuck in he <coughs> he like a flying amber. I'd be pissed too if it were me. to dystopia well done i've attached the payment your old i trust that you'll keep quiet about what exactly was liberated from Lou's little museum i'll come collect the books from kindly sheng shortly mr drake <coughs> claim payment for the wampa garden murders <coughs> you submit the job is finished and await the response from kindly sheng to dystopia the wampans tells me that they've ousted all of their council of elders something to do with you exposing their efforts to cover up their own mess it isn't the res resolution I, I expected, but I think it's acceptable. <coughs> if there's one thing I don't trust, it's people who won't pay what, they're, what they owe. Thankfully, the Wampoans are more reliable than Neng and her allies, and so am I. Your payment is touch. <coughs> felt a bit weak. <coughs> Hell 
Duce is told the well-built human has been watching you since the moment you entered Club 88. Surreptitiously, of course, glances over his shoulder and the like, but you're certain he's been watching you. He finally speaks as you draw near. I hear you're the one to talk about work in the shadows. Yeah, that's right. <coughs> he nods in satisfaction, expression relaxing a bit. Good, because I'm looking for work here in Hong Kong, but I don't have my own team. Call me El Duce, I'm a street samurai. Good with shotguns, close combat, and I've got a bit of medical know-how on top of that. My rates are reasonable, unless it's a run against Shiawas. Shiawase, in that case, it's completely free. Why run free for free against Shiawase? <coughs> because the sons of bitches killed my wife and stole my son. Duce's voice is hard and flat. Anything to screw them over. I don't need to get paid for it. <coughs> okay, I can understand being upset about that. Duce nods in satisfaction. Good. The bastards were in it for a cheap payday. Just another body to add to their assembly line. You ever heard of type O immune systems? No, what's that mean? It means that his organ and blood can be donated to anyone. They're universally compatible. If a company wants to pr reproduce bioware on the sheep, they use sinless type O bodies as templates to grow, them, grow the ware in. Human factories, basically. <coughs> Sick stuff. But it's not like we can complain to anybody. Officially, we don't even exist. Shaking his head, Duce looks away. Let's talk about something else, okay? <coughs> Back again, I say. Didn't catch your name before. Didn't catch yours either. I'm Dystopia. Ermin Kafai. Pleased to meet you. We get a lot of passers through. After their business with the Dockman or the Yellow Lotus, they get escorted here to relax and shop. Then they leave. <coughs> I'm happy to never know their names, but you're a different story, aren't you? What have you heard? <coughs> Not much yet. So what can I do for you? Have you heard of a man named Raymond Black? I seem to recall a blurb on the news, <coughs> but I didn't pay much attention. Not a name I know, and if it was a name worth knowing, I'd know it. Let's have a look at what you're selling. Portugal grenade launcher that fires mini grenades. Cap 6, AOE 3. Cap 1, AOE 3. Damage 14. <coughs> it seems like it's the Heckler and Koch there, but uh, I'm thinking of getting a sniper rifle actually. What's the best sniper rifle? <coughs> Ruger 100S. One hundred S smart link damage sixteen. Start staying in the back if I'm gonna go more hacking. <coughs> Whatever it takes, show me what you got. <coughs>
Oh shit. Travel to the Repulse Bay uh, Hotel to dig up information on Neville Mo Sorry, Duncan, but you only do one thing. You arrive at the epoph eponymously named Repulse Bay, a gleaming hotel and apartment building on the shores of Repulse Bay, Hong Kong Island. Rolling storm clouds choke the sky, lending the structure a sinister appearance. As you push through the doors and into the building, a sudden break in the clouds reveals a sun that's gone red as blood. You make your way into the ground floor elevator. The attendant pays you no mind. As the car begins to climb, you hear the sounds of merriment drawing closer. As the doors slide open, you find Neville Moss' party in full swing. <coughs> We should discuss our approach, Dystopia. <coughs> I would recommend searching the apartment as our first course of action. I am somewhat dubious about the idea of crashing the party. We ghouls are seldom welcome at such events. Sure, but Neville Ma and Pen Penelope Wong will be at the party. If we don't bluff our way in, we can't talk to them. Doc Shen Yang is paying us to find out how, how Ma is up and walking so quickly after the accident. Talking to, a guy would, uh, talking to the guy would probably be a good idea. <coughs> Let's get to the portal and see if we can dig anything up. You think you can get us in? Lead the way. She rubs her hands together excitedly. The catering of these uh, at these things is always top notch. You're talking we're talking caviar, dystopia. Booze with gold flecks in it. I think that I might smell pheasant. It smells like quite a feast, sweet and untouches, like duck fat and honeycomb, he sighs. A pity that my preferred dish won't be on the menu. Hey, you never know, maybe we'll get lucky. Uh, bear packs.
Decking one, cyber deck, jack in. Church, church, church. Once the alarm is uh, off, it's off. Total Data Core, welcome to the Repulse Base, Central Data Hub, please state query. Search for information on Neville Ma. Ma Neville, resident penthouse apartment 2, expand query. Apartment core, door code, 1635. Search other records. Select subject, events. One event found, Yellow Springs film private party, mezzanine level, front desk indication, six unclaimed invitation, download invitation, download invitations. <coughs> Planned hotel expansion. Payday day. Maintenance logs. <coughs> Access and maintenance log. Reams of data flood the screen. Uh, everything organized by way of reference numbers. It's an incredible obtuse and a confusing system. Without knowing what number to search for, there's little value to see here. Sullen looking troll stands on the periphery of the kitchen. He turns to you, shoulder slump, forward in size. No restaurant service tonight. The kitchen staff too busy with the party to serve anyone. Wish I could get onto that balcony. He sniffs the air wistfully. All that delicious food. <laughs> Looks fancy. Who's throwing this shindig? A trade producer, <coughs> I think. Saw some actors out there earlier. Same ones who act in uh, Promises in Moonlight. He fiddles shyly. Have you seen the show? I'm afraid not. His eyes widen excitedly. You need to see it. It's the best show on trade deal ever. He leans in. Face inches from yours ever. I'll uh, get right on it. Good luck with the kitchen, buddy. <coughs> the 
the security guard stands in front of the patio, a bored expression on his face. He looks you up and down as you approach. Private party pal, invite. His eyes land on Gaishu and his face goes white. He recoils in horror. What the hell? Ghoul! Ghoul in the lounge! <laughs> Be silent. His voice comes out in a raspberry hiss. Calm yourself. You are going to cause a panic. The guard stares at you, his mouth agape. What the hell do you think you're doing? Bring a ghoul in here. <laughs> he's not a ghoul. He's an HM, uh, HVV infected person who, appear, who happens to be a friend of Penelope Wong. And we have invitations. He takes the invitations and scrutinizes it. He then looks at you. Reluctant, like reluctance plains on his face. Enjoy the party, sir. <coughs> the ragged waiter managed to straighten up as you approach. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the veranda at the Repulse Bay. How may I be of service? I've got some questions about Neville Ma. Heard of him? His expression clouds. Certainly. Everyone knows Mr. Ma. Would you consider him a de decent man? Between you and me, he's difficult. Which is putting it lightly. Man runs the staff ragged. He jerks his thumb, thumb in the direction of Rwanda. That's his party out there. Riches like him love to, his, love to display their wealth. Sounds like you have some stories. <coughs> he lowers his voice. Like you wouldn't believe. He once made a handful of us walk all the way out to Sheko to fetch dumplings for his guests. It was pouring out with winds uh, blowing around 50 km per hour. Practically a death march in that weather. Why didn't the kitchen here make Ma some dumplings? Ma said the kitchen dumplings weren't good enough. Called them peasant food in front of all his uh, guests. Chef Kang was uh, furious, of course, but uh, since Ma's rich, hotel management told us to give him whatever he wanted. By the time we got back from uh, Sheko, the dumplings were cold, the party was over, and Ma had retired to his suite with a pair of starlets. We had to pay for those dumplings out of our own damn pockets. A couple days later, Kevin came down with pneumonia from the trip, lost his job over it. And that's just one of the experiences with him. Needless to say, no one's here a fan of the man. But we pay to serve the tenants here, so that's what we do. He shrugs. It's a living. You look exhausted, why don't you take a break? Not yet, I can't afford to miss any tips, he sighs. I went to Macau last week, and it wiped me out. Bad luck for with the horses, you know. I'm in a pretty lucrative trade myself, care to make a deal? The waiter uh, stares at you suspiciously, but this desperation gets the better of me. I'm listening. <coughs> I need access to the penthouse apartment, uh, but I already got that. You know what? Never mind. I already got the code for it. The portugoer raises an eyebrow at your approach. They're serving century-old cabernet like punch here. It's hard to believe, considering how much a single bottle cost. But it's even harder to believe Mr. Moss hosting this party, and so soon after his accident. I heard about that. Doesn't seem to have slowed him down. The man's a machine. He smirks, amused by himself. Not literally, but he might as well be the way he sprang back after being T-boned at 140 clicks an hour. Jesus, how's he even standing? I don't know, but here, here he is, alive and kicking, or dining, regaling, what have you. If you ask me, it's all that positive key the fans have stirred up. I heard there was were entire message boards praying for him and making offerings at the temples. The Matrix is uh, nuts for promises in moonlight. If uh, Ma hadn't negotiated a second season, his fans would just as easily have turned on him. No way, the internet can't send you key. Much less fix a broken body. Call it key or luck or whatever you want. Ma's here, so he must be doing something right. All I know for sure is that I'm glad he's back in the business. And serving us buckets full of Cabernet. He catches sight of someone across the room and waves. Lisa, over here. Gives you a curt note. Nice talking to you. Neville Moy is dressed in an immaculate suit, sur surveying his party from the edge of the balcony. As you approach, he inclines his head respectfully. Good evening, mister. I'm sorry, I don't believe we've been formally introduced. Uh, he straightens his wristwatch. I'm Neville Moy, owner of Yellow Spring Studios. <coughs> the pleasure's all mine, Mr. Moy. Call me Mr. Aid, Argent. Thanks so much for hosting this gala. You're very welcome. It's uh, important to show the industry and the press that Promises in Moonlight is doing well and that we're still a local operation. I hope that you're enjoying yourself. <coughs> I've heard about your accident. How did it happen? He sighs. 
It seems as though that's all anyone wants to hear about these days. To be honest, I'm getting rather tired of repeating the story. Suffice it to say, a delivery truck, a drone, experienced a glitch and ran a red light. If it hadn't hit me, uh, if it hadn't hit me, it would have hit someone else. Sounds like... No. Did the police discover anything unusual? Not really. Apparently, the latest software update to the truck had gotten corrupted, but that was all they found. It was shocking to discover that the delivery company missed the glitch, but I suppose that it's a mistake anyone could have made, and certainly not enough to point to any one person. You were discharged from the hospital pretty quickly after your accident. Your treatments must have been expensive. <coughs> not especially. Guangzhou's hospitals are top tier. Confidentiality. Uh, my rapid uh, recovery mostly came uh, down to luck. The accident could have been a lot worse than it was. I owe Eurocar a lot of thanks for their safety features. Thanks for talking to me, Mr. Mo. My pleasure. Please enjoy the party. The glamorous starlet flashes you a standard celebrity smile. Lovely, but emotionless. Good evening, Penelope Wong. But please, call me Penelope. Pleased to meet you, Penny. Name's Argyle. She lifts her drink and takes a tentative sip. What brings you to our little soiree, Mr. Argyle? I don't believe I've seen you around the studio before. It's a friend of a friend sort of situation. He asked me to check in on Neville. Seems he's uh, recovered quickly, considering the accident. A smile lights up her face. Oh, it was absolutely miraculous, I must admit. I nearly died of fright when I heard what happened. But uh, to look at Neville now, you'd never guess he'd been hurt. Just miraculous. <coughs> I'll keep the secret if you will. It's a shame the rumor mills caught wind, though. There are rumors? She blinked. I haven't heard any rumors. Just jealous babbling, you know the kind, that he's embezzling from the studio to pay for the treatment, etc. Her face reddens, that's ridiculous, the studio's doing better than ever, we're even expanding, no money lost here. <coughs> I wouldn't put any stock in Matrix rumors, especially the ones about new investment partners. Someone new? For a moment, she's lost in thought, face twisted in concentration. No, I don't think so. But Neville did make some new friends while he was in Gang Show. Oh? There was a woman, I can't remember her name, uh, who now visits Neville regularly. I hear she's quite a fashionista. <coughs> it's a business or personal relationship. Penelope shucks. They seem to get on well. I'm a little sad he's never introduced us, though. She's supposed to make an appearance tonight. I'm very much looking forward to meeting her. Penelope's uh, gaze drifts over your shoulder for a moment, and she smiles at someone behind you. Oh, please excuse me. That's Mr. Yao, and I promised him I'd say hello tonight. Enjoy the party. Thank you, Penny. It was a pleasure. Take the elevator to the penthouse floor. <coughs> Input code. 1000 rows of finely tailored suit, custom shoes and various accessories fill this, uh, fill this room. This fridge is well stocked, there's enough food in there to feed a big party. <coughs> <coughs> the 
The liquor cabinet is full of expensive wines and spirits. Several decanters sit atop it, but one in particular catches your eye. A bottle of brilliantly bright red wine. Still a sip. You take a gulp and quickly gag. The wine is strangely warm given the temperature of the room and is dis disgustingly salty. Interesting. His nose wrinkles as he tastes the air. <coughs> I'll be taking that with me if you don't mind. Uh, go ahead, it's vile. Not your vintage, hmm? I'm not surprised, but I find the aroma quite enticing. He stows the bottle in his pack. <coughs> Tastes like chicken. Drink some of the blood in exit stage left. The opposite side of the living room is dominated by a massive security door. It's much heavier than the exterior apartment door, and it looks like a recent addition. The wall was <coughs> has clearly been reinforced to support it. A series of top-of-the-line commercial-grade maglocks hold the doors sealed. It would be easier to tunnel through the wall than it would be to break them open. Examine the door. A cursory glance at the door frame reveals no sign of a keypad or a yak point, but you do see what appears to be an RFID reader. A 16-digit number has been stenciled onto the side of the reader in red ink. This is good work. It looks quite sturdy. I doubt that... We could make a uh, break through it without bringing the wool down in the process. I wonder why he opted to fortify an interior door like this. <coughs> to keep up appearances, if he installed it in the hallway, people would talk. A man of mass stature would not want that. Well, one thing is certain. We aren't getting through there without a key. Most likely, that means that we will have to get one from Ma or from one of his people. Ah, oh, shucks. I guess we'll just have to go back to the party. I mean, that is the next logical step. Tell me we're going to the party. <coughs> Looks that way. Saddle up. We got a party to attend. There's a heavy security door in Neville Moss' apartment. Know anything about that? The waiter opens his mouth to reply, then pauses. Just how do you know about that? When were you in Moss' apartment? A few days ago, I left something in there, and I need, a, need to get it back. We don't want to cause a scene. I mean, we could go bother Ma during his party, but that would look just as bad for, uh, for you as it would for us. He lowers his waist. Tell you what, try talking to Chef Kang in the kitchen. He's got keys to just about every door in the place. On VIP requests, he's expected to personally deliver their meals. It's a status thing. Compliments of the chef or whatever. Poor guy spends as much time delivering food as he does cooking it. <coughs> Where's the try? Thanks. The chef looks up from his pot and boiling water, red face and sweating. A name tag is pinned to his label. Chief, Chief, Chef Victor Kang. So I told him to send in the waiter. Who the hell are you? <coughs> Moss got this door in his room. Big thing. Practically indestructible. And someone said that you can get me inside. Yeah, I could do that. And I could also lose my job for it. Even go to jail. Sounds like a real winning winner of a proposition for me. He strains a wad of boiled fish through a sieve. Got uh, work to do, stranger. Doors that way. I heard Mo insulted your dumplings in front of his guests. That's harsh. His expression hardens. Yeah, cost me a race and a whole lot of face. I'll bet that bastard didn't lose a wink of sleep over it either. With a single motion, the chef lops off a fish's head. I know a thing or two that'll uh, have Ma churning in his silk pajamas. Consider your, f your key for the means to an end. Yeah, gladly. He grabs a plastic tab from his apron pocket and tosses it to ruin him, will you? Or at the very least, ruin his day. I'll consider it a bonus if you wreck his anemic uh, girlfriend and giddy starlet's day too. <coughs> sure, but I'll need uh, to know more, especially about the girlfriend. What's her name? He uh, snaps his fingers irritably. Ku Feng, that's, that's it. She's the rich wench who paid for Ma's hospital stay. Skinny, anemic thing, never eats. All she ever orders is cheap red wine. 
First I thought it was a fling, but now I'm not so sure. Maybe you can split them up. I'll thank you for it. Don't suppose you take her uh, wine warm and salted. I've, uh, I've heard rumors. His eyes narrow. A warm salty wine. What a disaster. Now she just orders wi wine. Plain old wine. Wouldn't stop her from sipping in her own seasonings, though. Alright, thanks for your help, chef. No, thank you. As you approach the door, a light set into your key fob goes from red to green. There is a loud series of thunks and the door slides open. A blast of frigid air floods into the room from the other side. <clears throat> An expensive consumer grade computer terminal awaits your input. The display background is set to a screen capture from Promises in Moonlight. Penelope Wong's radiant face beams at you from the corner of the screen. This must be Moss Personal Terminal, not a bad place to do some digging. Log into the computer as a guest. A few keystrokes is all it takes to get into the computer's file structure. With the high-tech security door in his apartment, it seems Ma never bothered to encrypt his machine. An option menu appears on the screen. Search email. You read through Moss email. Most of it's spam and boring business arrangement, but one detail stands out. Neville Ma is frequently emailing a woman named Ku Feng. They seem close, exchanging a lot of uh, thinly veiled flirtation. It appears that Neville has been lavishly lavishing Ku Feng uh, with money and affection, expensive gifts, rent checks, miserable attempts at poetry, seeing to it that her every need is met. Search financial record. Neville's financial records are astoundingly boring, aside from two major things. He spent next to nothing on his hospital bills, where it appears he only stayed for three days. And he's spending a lot of money on a woman named Kufeng, jewelry, bills, clothes, and such. Unlock office door. <coughs> With the push of a button, you unlock the office door. On the other side of the room, an ominous thunk reverberates throughout the cold steel apartment. Without warning, a frigid wind blows through the apartment. The shield cuts through your clothes, raising goose flesh all over your body. Where is that coming from? There is another blast of cold, and a pale and imposing woman materializes out of thin air. A throng of black-faced men and women materialize alongside her. Ah, that little dog who's been sniffing around Neville Ma's affairs. Her voice is imperious, arrogant. Ku Feng, I presume. She nods. Just so. My servants have been watching you since you arrived. I suspect that you are an evil man, and that you are here to, harm, to do harm to Neville. And so, I've come to stop you. Be careful to stop you. Her aura is streaked with corruption. I can practically taste it. His lips curl. She is a vampire. These others are her pawns. And you are a ghoul. Why these people would choose to associate with a corpse eater is a mystery to me. Perhaps you are their pet. Gaishu tightens his fingers on the hilt of his katana. Who will eat whom, leech? Come for me and let us see whose teeth are sharper. Gobbet leans over and whispers to you. An uh, HMHVV deathmatch. Admit it, Dystopia. You'd pay to watch that. Yes, yes I would. She smiles at you with blood red lips. An armed conflict in this room would bring security within moments. The Hong Kong police force would no doubt arrive shortly thereafter. Is that what you want? It makes no difference to me. I can disappear just as swiftly as I arrived. But you, on the other hand. She's right, we can't fight in here. Doc Shen Yang told us that we wouldn't get paid if we did. We appear to have uh, reached an impasse. I cannot allow you to leave, and you seem intent on continuing your investigation here. So how shall we resolve this conundrum? <coughs> I won't get paid if we fight in here, and no doubt the police will want answers. There's another way. A more formal arrangement then, a face-off in a neutral location. A duel at midnight works for me. Very well, she steeples her fingers. As for the terms, if I win, you willingly submit to my influence. You become my pawn. And if you win, we'll cross the, that bridge when we come to it. She nods, grinning. Wait 15 minutes for the sun to go down, then come to the roof. 
We'll settle this there, like gentlemen and ladies. The sun dips below the horizon, mist coalesces, coating the rooftop in dew. Ku Feng and her cohorts appear. <coughs> Are you prepared to become my servant, human? You must not resist, or I will be forced to kill you. Should it come to that, I'll endeavor to make, a swift and painless, make it swift and painless, but no promises. Let's see what you've got. It should be entertaining. Kill him. The ley lines look a bit weird. Waves upon the shore, damage level. Ah, okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, he does combos.
things uh, calm and haughty demeanor dissolves as her eyes grow wild. Wait, wait, I surrender. Don't kill me. What's wrong? Not feeling so powerful now. She clasps her hands, pleading. The whole mistress of the night thing is just an act. I'm just an accountant that got infected. I don't uh, really know how to fight. I was faking it. I just wanted to scare you into backing down. <coughs> Look how that turned out. Yeah, I know. I blew it. I knew that this duel was a bad idea the moment I agreed to it. But I couldn't back down in front of my pawns. It would have been humiliating. She looks away. <laughs> like I said, I'm just an accountant. I never went to, the va to vampire school. What I did do was get <coughs> drunk on a business trip, black out, and wake up in an alley like this. And so you what? Decided to embrace the whole vampire thing. What choice did I have? I couldn't go back to work, and it was a dead-end job anyway. No upward mobility, no room for growth. I did what uh, anyone would have done. I tried to make the best of it, to capitalize on my new abilities. I'm a vampire now, I can't control that, but I can control how I choose to monetize it. So what was your endgame? How did you see this working out? It's me. It's not like I have a rule book for this or anything. I'm just making it up as I go along. Who knows, maybe I could eventually become the vampire queen of Repulse Bay. <coughs> I hate to break it to you, but that isn't likely to happen. Don't you, don't you think that? I know that. I've been training uh, to use a printing calculator, not bite people's necks. I'm just doing my best. She looks away in shame. <coughs> Her voice goes flat. Look, if I'm ever found out, I'll be killed for m bounty money. It was uh, either this or get gunned down by a vampire hunter. How did you manage to survive? I've been hiding out in Kowloon. I was hoping to just disappear. As far as my friends and family know, I'm missing, maybe dead. Her chest hitches. She looks miserable. I think that's for the best. I mean, how could I explain what I'd become? Can you imagine how ashamed my family would be to find out that I'd become this monster? No, it's better that they think I'm dead. You are pathetic, weak. His lip curls into a sneer. You are given the power of gods and you snivel about feelings. What is wrong with you? You never wanted... I never wanted to be this way. I'm trying my best. Your best is barely com competent. You squander your potential, then brawl about your cast off life. Ball about your cast off life when you're defeated. You don't deserve the gift that you've been given. No, you're right. I'm not cut out for this. She turns to you, a look of misery smeared across her face. Can we call a truce? Maybe? I scratch her back. You let me live, please. Think we can work something out, conditionally. She nods eagerly. Yes, yes, anything. Just tell me what you need. <clears throat> First off, I want some answers. I'll tell you whatever you want to know. You ask the questions and I'll answer. No lying, I promise. How are you and Neville Ma collected? I happen to be in the same hospital that he was, trolling for a meal. I don't like to drink blood from unwilling people, so I go to hospitals at night looking for people who won't mind if I take a sip. People in comas, patients with terminal illness, illnesses, that kind of thing. It makes me feel better about what I have to do. So I wandered into this room and I recognized Neville Ma. I'd seen him on the news, seen photos of the accident. He was in real bad shape, a lot of broken bones and internal injuries. But somehow he was still conscious, so he offered to help. Well, I knew that if I gave uninfected people my blood, they'd be able to heal like I did, just not as fast. <coughs> I'd figured that out early and by mistake, but I can... But it can come in handy from time to time. So when I saw that Neville was conscious, I decided to make my grand appearance. I materialized in the room and told him that I'd make him a trade. I'd fix him up, good as new, but he'd owe me some favors for it. Uh, I wasn't specific as to how many favors or what kind. He agreed, actually. He leapt at the chance to become my pawn. I guess that's, uh, that's when you're all broken up like that. You'll do just about anything to get better. The deal was done, and we got along. I think he's charming. He thinks I'm funny, and he doesn't care that I'm a vampire. <coughs> he told me that he gives me nice things because he likes me, and not because he owes me his life. It's all very sweet. Is there a cure? I wish, but no. The only cure is being tossed in a bonfire or having your head cut off. And almost every nation in the world will pay a bounty for a dead vampire. It's not like I had much of a choice, you know. Be a vampire or get killed for some quick cash. It's a pretty raw deal for me either way. What's it like to be a vampire? About the same as being a person. 
the human meta human vampire virus is like uh, <coughs> any other disease except instead of coughing I can't go out during the day it's not all bad though I can turn into mist and I'm a lot stronger than I used to be I still have to wash my hair and pay for parking you know what I miss the most steamed buns I can't eat or drink anything except blood and I loved street food before I got infected Sometimes I walk by food carts just to smell the thing they're frying up. But if I buy something, ten minutes later it all comes back up in a mess. I just wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> You're going to live up to your potential, and I'm going to help you. She blinks. You're? We are? <coughs> So you don't know how to be a monster. Well, as it happens, I have a bona fide monster right here. Gaichu will teach you what to do. And why would I do that to stop that? I fail to understand. <laughs> because I've decided that I like you, and I can think of worse friends to have at my side than a vampire. A brilliant smile breaks out across her face. Well, in that case, I accept gratefully. What about Dr. Shen Yang? What are we supposed to tell him? He wants Penelope Wong. What do you say, Ku Feng? Think you can get Neville to let her go? In a heartbeat. Neville can't say no to me. He'll do it. No question. <clears throat> Excellent. Let this be the first of many favors that you pay me. She bows, smiling. It is settled then. May this be the beginning of a long and fruitful relationship. <laughs> Uh, take the elevator to the mezzanine floor. Do I need to do anything else? Return to Dr. Shinya. Hioi, the, the clink of glasses and sounds at Neville's Moss party fades into the distance as you leave the Repulse Bay. As the MTR carries you towards Hioi, the mountain of Hong Kong Island rolled by as looming masses, obscured by rain and storm clouds. Penelope Wong has been fired from Promises in Moonlight, and Ma will be at a serious disadvantage without her. The whims of trade viewers shift as readily as the tide, and without the starless presence, Promises in Moonlight will undoubtedly lose rating. What's more, you've managed to turn a powerful foe into a potential ally. One time, one time will tell how Ku Feng will repay you. Only time will tell, however. Oh, move back.
Shen Yang is busily puffing away on a foul-smelling cigar, his comlink in one hand, his eyes flash with anticipa- anticipatory glee as he sees you. Dr. Shen Yang greets you in the name of all producers. How the Shin did go? I got the information you wanted. You explain the night's event from start to finish as you speak. Shen Yang's face grows even more incredulous until finally his uh, mouth is left hanging halfway open. He slowly places the cigar in a nearby ashtray and shakes his head in disbelief. Vampires in the trid industry, a vampire queen no less, what a nightmare. At least you got me one, and poor Neville's show is dead, that's something. Alright kid, I'll send payment to your matrix drop. You earned it. Glad to be able to help. Dr. Shen Yang is about to speak, but his comlink begins to buzz. Irritated, he answers it and switches to speaker mode. Yeah, who is it? What do you want? Hello Shen Yang. I just want to let you know that I released Penelope Wong from her contract. If you're still interested in her, she's all yours. Also, I hope your business is doing all right. I'd heard you'd have some problem with cash flow. If you need a loan, I'd be happy to help. Dr. Shen Yang eyes uh, the image of Neville Ma with deep suspicion. You don't sound too mad, Neville. What's the catch here, anyway? You must have the next uh, big thing lined up already. Oh, doctor, there's no need for it. Do you want to know why I keep winning our little contest and you're always playing catch-up? It's because you think people like Miss Wong actually matters. They don't. Stars are crafted, molded out of talent, yes, but ultimately constructed. With enough time and effort, anyone can be made into a star. (coughs) It's just a question of manipulating public perception. Maybe so, but I got her now. And your show's dead in the water without a star. What do you think of that, eh? I think that I'm going to do what any good soap opera producer would do. Write uh, her character out with a tragic death and bring on someone new. The la- your, you labor under the mis- misapprehensions that viewers have loyalty. They don't. They have only appetite. As long as you chase stars like Wong, you will lose. Don't be afraid to think bigger, Doctor. Reach for the drama, not for the dramatists. With that, Neville Ma hangs up on Dr. Shen Yang. For the next 30 seconds, Dr. Shen Yang releases a stream of violently imitative invectives at his phone. Even Strangler Bao t- looks taken aback at the ferocity of Shen Yang's anger and the inventiveness of the sexual positions that he describes. Finally, he takes a deep breath and composes himself. The dirty little weasel, insulting my creativity like that. The nerve. Go on, kid, we're done here. Thanks for all your help, but I gotta get going. I gotta talk to a guy about uh, buying a bunch of snakes. She gains a katana ability, plus 100 damage, but can only attack stun targets. That she takes a bite out of his foe, restoring 8 HP of 2 rounds and gaining 1 strain through the consumption of their flesh. Travel through Shangri-La to kidnap Rooster Lou. Yes, 
guess we'll try and not bring the... <laughs> <laughs> the ninja ghoul when we go to uh, public places. A tangle of marine decorum, restless lights and ambrosial scents mingle atop a floating quay to accent the Shangri-La, Aberdeen's harbour's premier dining location. With competitive views of the surrounding bay, the restaurant attracts a steady crowd of tourists and boxing personnel. The primary monument for the 289's Shung Sing, Rooster Lu, is enjoying a rare meal outside of Triad Hill territory. Intel says he is set up in one of the restaurant's private dining rooms, but he is not alone. Rooster keeps a personal bodyguard, a notorious orc called the Talon, in addition to his regular security detail. You've seen photos of the Talon's handwork. Body is so battered it's hard to tell we where one bruise ends and the next begins. Your mission, locate Rooster, extract him from the Shangri-La and deliver him to the clients alive. Simple, fast, low profile. Of course, even the simplest of runs can go sideways. Stepping into the anterior hallway of the Shangri-La, you are confronted by a massive wall of troll, the restaurant's front door security. He speaks with surprising eloca elocution. Welcome to the Shangri-La. We strive to provide our patrons with an exquisite dining experience. If you have any questions or require special accommodations, don't hesitate to speak with our staff. <coughs> Small crowd, where are all the diners? Most of our weekday business is confined to the private rooms upstairs, corporate affairs and such. <coughs> he looks you up and down, frowns. Please keep in mind that any disturbances will be promptly de-escalated de by our security. We reserve the right to bar service to unruly patrons. Thank you and enjoy your meal. You say that, but I don't see any guards working here. Oh, maybe not. What security? I don't see any guards around. With a puff of his chest and, sm and shake of his shoulders, the troll assumes a more aggressive posture. His face remains a mask of neutrality, despite the obvious irritation in his voice. Vaxing prides itself on having world-class security personnel. You do well to remember that the best kind of security is often hidden from sight. Under a breath, pretty hard to not see that guy. A waitress swamped with orders is caught unaware by her approach. Oh, welcome to Shangri-La, sir. Our hostess will seat you as soon as she gets back. You're welcome to wait in the lounge. All right, thanks. A well-dressed man sits alone at the bar, elbow propped atop the counter. His face is hard, eyes blank. He swirls the contents of his half-empty glass as if in a stupor. Between the swollen eyes and whiskey double, it's also, it's, it isn't hard to guess his mood. As you approach, he rubs his temples and grace you with a lazy sideways glance, mumbles under his breath. Yeah, not like I can dig myself any deeper. Rough day? Hmm. <clears throat> He looks at you again through dull, bloodshot eyes, but his gaze drifts elsewhere before returning to his drink. Those two contracts missed the third, late for a meeting and publicly shamed by my co-workers, all during the nine to five. New record for as far as I can tell. He takes a long pull from his glass, exhales. At least I got that uh, going for me. <coughs> How'd you lose your contracts? Wish I knew. One of them was almost a done deal. But for some reason, the client suddenly changed their tune, and the contract slipped away before I could officially close it. The other two contracts were ongoing clients, people I'd worked with for years, but I somehow forgot about their annual renewal date, and a more diligent co-worker picked them up. I got no credit for a long-term partnership with those clients, if anything. 
and now look worse for losing them, even though I brought them into boxing in the first place. He leans back and lets out a weary groan. His breath reeks of alcohol. Sounds like too many coincidences to me. Think someone's working against you? You're kidding me. Everyone's at each other's throat in this business. He downs the rest of his drink, signals to the bartender in a signal movement. The bartender leans over and refills the glass. Fair, but is there someone who would, uh, who would have benefited most uh, from what's happened to you? He considers this. The newcomer, David. <coughs> Henry nods his uh, head toor towards the group at the end of the bar, an elf at its center. Him. He came out of nowhere and has become a rock star with upper management. He's been making connections and deals like a boxing veteran, like me. He's definitely up to no good. You're telling me, you want to know what I think? He leans towards you, glassy eyes looking through you to who knows where. The scent of booze wafts off him. I think he's got family connections, people in high places, and he's been using them to his advantage. He backs off and shrugs, rocking precariously on his chair. I don't know, it's just a thought. You might be onto something. Henry grunts and stares into his glass. No, no, just wist wishful thinking. Well, I'm going to find out. A guard steps forward and raises his hand. Sorry, sir, this area is off limit. And why is that? Is it the boxing employee patio, reserved for boxing customers and their guests? General uh, public is not admitted. Why don't you head back to your table? There's ample seating in the main dining room. What if I ask nicely? Will you let me through? <laughs> Corner of the guard's mouth cracks into a weak smile. Sorry, but not even the mighty please and thank you will help you here. <coughs> David is all smiles. He's just finished a joke the, to the uproarious laughter of his party. Hello, friend. Trying to get in on this uh, joviality. You're welcome to join us for the next round. His words, words bleed into each other. This isn't his first drink. What are we celebrating? My recent successes. Though some, through some hard work and a little business persuasion, he winks at you knowingly. I sealed two contracts and a third is on the way. Hey, congratulations. Next round's on me. David Beams, here's a real friend. Come, let's drink. He slams back a shot and hoots uh, with satisfaction. Much appreciated. Thank you, my good man. So from one friend to another, how did you bag all those contracts in one day? A fresh flush fills uh, David's cheeks. He wobbles on the spot and grins at you. Wasn't too hard, truth be told. Someone did most of the work for me. You see that poor sot down there? He gestures to Henry. We just uh, upgraded our security at, ho at work. A few nights ago, that fool left behind a note containing his new password. I wrote it down and had some fun. Sent nasty messages to his client. Removed a couple appointments from his schedule. David tosses his hands into the air, spilling his drink. And boom, I'm employee of the month. All I had to do was some damage control. But that man's clients, they're now mine. Nicely done. Very clever, my friend. His uh, cocky smile stretches across his uh, all-too-proud face. I thought so too. Thanks again for the drink, friend. You have yourself a good night. Hey, dystopia. These guys are right on the edge. Both blasted. One pissed off, the other was an asshole. One word and these guys will be throwing down. That happens loud enough. Security is bound to re respond. Just a thought. Indeed. <clears throat> a heady aroma of spices and sweat bombards your senses as the cooks move through the kitchen. Scents uh, churn in their wake. Some sharp, some sweet, some altogether unfamiliar, but all delicious. The chef barks an order to his assistant, searing fish, then whirls around muttering fervently to himself. He stops short once he notices you standing in the kitchen. I told him I needed an extra server, not a hobo. Shoo! He gestures toward the door and returns to tasting an array of sauces. An open program tracking food orders and their respective tables flickers steadily in the computer screen. Manager's note. Notice. Nothing but your typical wage slave directives in here. There are a few mentions of curtailing recreational activities in storage rooms and on other deck, outer deck. One, one can only infer the meaning of said activities. Further down, a note in red expressively warns that the special guests on floor two should be served by appropriate wait staff only, 
And if the guest orders are botched again, there will be significant and widespread consequences for all service involved. Check orders. <coughs> A list containing dozens of orders pops up. Only a handful are for the upper floor's uh, private dining rooms. One note on the floor, second floor order stands out. Floor 2, private room 3, VIP party of 5. <coughs> Inside this uh, file is a series of notes on guests and the restaurant's operations. You scroll through today's notes. Several servers have written about their concerns regarding tonight's lack of security, and a couple are frustrated with the curious guests wandering up to the second floor's private dining rooms. The rest is useless information. Enter new order. A menu pops up with options to view or place orders. Following the menu is a dining room chart that's been broken down into ser server zones. A large comp button in the upper right corner has a lock icon over it. Seems people were being too liberal with the free drinks. Unfortunately, it looks like you need a server's code to place an order. <coughs> this will only take a second. A loud exhalation escapes through her nose and her eyes dart towards the kitchen. She musters an empty smile and nods in false hospitality. Absolutely, sir. What is it you need? How's business? She glances around, impatiently searching for an excuse to end the conversation. As always, we're very busy, but I see a couple of parties preparing to leave, so you won't have to wait long for a table. If you decide to wait in the lounge, please be aware that a group of our preferred boxing diners are celebrating inside. We'd appreciate it if you'd respect their privacy. Her fingers anxiously tapped the food orders, clutched tightly in her hand. Anything else? I'm looking for someone, a Mr. Lowe. He has a reservation here tonight. Sorry, I'm not familiar with that name. I'll bet a hard-working waitress like yourself sir, is good with faces. You'd certainly remember this man. He travels with a big work who's got a nasty scar on his cheek. She fiddles with her scratch <coughs> pad and eyes the plenteous order scrolled across its uh, top page. After a moment of consideration, she speaks. I might know the work. If he's who I'm thinking of, he only comes around a couple of times a year. I've never seen, I've never served him, but I've heard he gets real pushy with the other waitresses. Pushy, huh? Why is that? He's allergic to shellfish, I think. We got so many orders. Sometimes mistakes are made. A hint of fear flashes across her face. Ah, I didn't just say that. I can assure you our service is second to none. She nervously peeks over her shoulder. Tell me where my friend's eating, and I won't mention your little indiscretion to a soul. Sir, this is the Shangri-La. We have over two dozen private dining rooms in addition to our main dining floor. As I've already said, I serve out here. Your friends could uh, be in any of our other rooms. Now excuse me, I need to place these orders. Enjoy your meal. And with that, she wheels around and marches towards the kitchen. <coughs> the chef peers uh, at you over the mountain of oysters. No guests in the kitchen. Out. Sorry to intrude, but I need to speak with the head chef. He grabs a towel off a nearby rack and wipes his hands, grumbling to himself. I'm head chef. I've, n I've little time to cook my food and even less for conversations. <coughs> Don't give me that. I'm a guest here and I deserve answers to my questions. Just make it quick. You've got 60 seconds before I have to pull these prawns out of the boiler. <coughs> I'm told one of the tonight's uh, guests has a shellfish allergy, a less than mild-mannered work. Sound familiar? That's a polite way to put it. Gave uh, two of my cook's broken ribs and a matching set of black eyes last time he stormed my kitchen. He waves his hand. Yes, I know that work. I got a shellfish allergy he's overly keen on hounding us about, as though this wasn't the top seafood restaurant in the sixth world. <coughs> Mr. 
Mistakes happen. Sometimes you reach for a mushroom and accidentally grab an oyster. Maybe such an accident happened to our work friend. Know what I'm saying? <laughs> what? He balks at your suggestion. After a moment, moment's recovery, he looks straight at your nostrils. You can't possibly say what I think you're saying. You want me to poison a diner. You're deranged. I'm calling security. Let's be honest. Everyone in that the Shangri La hates this guy. You make him sick, you make people happy. It's your call. The chef uh, squares his shoulders and sucks in his breath. You have some gall walking into my kitchen and telling me how to make my food. I'm a professional. Sure, diners can be dicks. They can be horrible. Wretched, shit-eating bottom crawlers. But the very idea of poisoning one of them and soiling my name is disgusting. You have a problem with the talent. Take it up with him yourself. Now get your craven ass out of here before I call for the guards. <coughs> you again. Why are you still wasting my time? You want a piece of this? No, then get out. This is important. I heard that one of your private diners throws a tantrum if his special orders are botched. A supplies way, blah, blah, uh, What would it take for him to wind up with a few shrimp in his meal tonight? <coughs> I just need your uh, hand to slip. Add an extra ingredient or two. The chef nervously wrings his towel between his hands, stares at the sumptuous plates of food waiting to be eaten. A glance over his shoulder, a shake of his head, and uh, he smiles, a small wry thing. You know, he never appreciated our cuisine, uh, our art. I think a special thanks is in order. See yourself out, won't you? Of course I will. You came back. Listen, that David Prick you mentioned. Turns out he broke into your work terminal and sent your client some nasty messages in your name. Then he swooped in and stole them. A spark of sobriety washes over Henry. The dullness in his eyes drains away and he sits up alarmed. That, that explains why no one would return my messages. With a grunt, he smashes his fists into the counter. He turns toward David and mutters through clenched teeth. He wants to play dirty? I can handle it. I can handle him. He jumps up and marches towards David. Henry and David stand inches from uh, one another, both men wearing the fiercest expression they can muster. Their hatred is almost palpable. How their confrontation will play out is unclear, but one thing is certain. You have a great seat. Henry stabs a finger into David's chest and speaks in a low hiss. You stole my business, and I know it. You might have picked this fight, but I'm going to win it, fair and fucking square. Show you how those uh, with integrity operate, you cheat. David's mouth eases into a contented uh, smirk. You want to lose face twice in one day? I'm happy to oblige, but not in here. I'll be damned if the Shangri-La bans me for thrashing a uh, worthless uh, crap stain like you on their property. Let's finish this outside now. Fine, but don't think that this will give you any sort of advantage. It only means I won't have to hold back. Let's go. <coughs> the old bar stool offers little in the way of comfort. A quick look around reveals the disparity between the restaurant proper and the bar, the latter of which uh, appears neglected in comparison to the pristine dining room. Old dried drink rings dapple the counter's uneven surface, and angry scratches run down its length. But you've got time to kill before Rooster arrives, and this is as good a spot to wait, uh, wait as any. <coughs> Have a seat and wait. The minutes tick away. Rooster should uh, be here any time now. An alarmed waiter in a tousled uniform stumbled into the kitchen. Chef, we have a problem. A big problem. Cut the drama, court mage. We're working here. We got a fight out front and a sick diner. And you're still in here, glazing dumplings. Uh, our second floor guest is pissed. His head of uh, security spewing up prawns and looking for someone to blame. Better brace yourself for a mouthful of fists. A howl and several thumps catch the cook cooking staff's attention. Appren apprehensive glances are tossed around the kitchen. Their fear abruptly confirmed as a huge orc bursts into the room. The jagged scar on the orc's cheek matches your client's description of the talon. Or it would if the talon's face weren't a lumpy, swollen, seeping mess. <laughs> the talon's face flushes in anger, or perhaps as a side effect of his allergy. 
and he raises a knobby finger to the room. What is wrong with this place? His swollen lips uh, spit more saliva than sound. Excuse me, sir, you're holding the kitchen up. If you have any questions or concerns, speak to our host up front. He runs on the, the chef, shoulders raised in disbelief. You got a concern, all right. A concern regarding this shit house you call a restaurant. His voice booms. This is the third time your slop pad have fucked up my order. I'm, if I'm regularly forced to choke down your garbage, I expect at the least some substitution to be followed. No shellfish. Get it right. Or next time someone's going to end up a whole lot worse than me. Duncan turns to you, eyebrows raised. And you called me short-fused. Maybe now you'll think twice before raging on me when things heat up. Oh no, I'll never stop ragging on you, Duncan. Hey, if the talent's down here, that means he's left the upstairs room unguarded. You're right, let's go while he's still distracted. Inside the private dining room, you're immediately greeted by the piercing stare of two massive dragon statues. The flickering lights are just bright enough to illuminate their bronze bodies, the effect on the eerie illusion of a slithering skate. Across the room stands your target, Shang Sing, rooster uh, low, hands uh, trembling at his side. A single anxious guard stands near the door. Something has them on edge. The talent is missing. <coughs> Sweat drips down Rooster's uh, gaunt face. His eyes uh, dart back and forth across the room, trying to size you up, assess the situation. Without support, he appears nothing more than a trapped ro rooster here, who, without his talents, is defenseless. In an effort to invoke a sense of authority, he raises his voice. Who are you? What do you want? If you please, uh, if you'll please come with me, we can make this easy, and don't try to argue. You're in a poor position with the talent missing. His anger flares. How dare you speak to me as if I were a child? Sue, where is the talent? Where is the rest of my security? A second passes while his eyes scour the room, looking for someone, <coughs> anyone, to come to his aid. Ne never you mind. Just get this street tramp out of here. Yes, sir. No talent, no backup, all alone. You must really like your boss. He glances at Rooster. Uh, not, not exactly, no. He begins to slowly back towards the door. Fact, you can have it. Good boy. <clears throat> no, wait, wait. Spare my life, I beg you, please. Drops a fat, uh, drops a spit spatter from his mouth. His desperation obvious. Stop that. I'm here to take you alive. Don't make me change my mind. Listen, Seattle, we, have, we may have Rooster, but these stiffs were probably just a handful of his guards. He could have more downstairs. We can't leave the same way we came in. If we're gonna get out, out of here in one piece, we need to find a new exit route fast. And I'm betting this chicken guy knows one. <clears throat> I bet you're right. Let's ask. Rooster's teeth are clattering inside his head. His frame shakes uncontrollably. The realization that he's at your mercy, with no one left to defend him, is setting in. Well, Mr. Lowe, mind pointing us to the exit? Rooster stammers incoherently for a moment, but his words uh, soon catch up with him. It's just outside of this room, to the right, but, but it's locked. And you have the key, don't you? He blinks, confused, his uh, shocked mind slowly processing your implication. Y yes, yes I do. He reaches into his coat pocket and withdraws a small key. I'll take that. Use Rooster service key, copy, to open the door. The comlink clicks, a burst of static, then the sound clears to reveal a soft voice. Dystopia, is this your channel? Sure is. Name's Pei Long, I'm your getaway driver. We have details to discuss, but let's keep it brief. Time's ticking. Another burst of static, and Pei Long continues. I'm at the loading dock across the bridge from the restaurant's main entrance. Big old schooner, can't miss me. But neither will the HKPF, <coughs> who I've just learned are on their way here in response to a security call. Well, shit, I'm on my way. 
One last thing, I may be the driver, but this ain't my rig. Door's locked and I don't know the code. You may have to break in. Good luck and get moving. I click and your comlink fills with static. Payload is gone. A pair of triad gangsters block your path. <coughs> Men, help me. The words start pouring out of the rooster's mouth so quickly that they blur together. You free me, get me away from here, and I guarantee you'll be rewarded. Nien, favors, power, whatever you want. The two guards exchange a look, then turns back to Rooster, smiling. Actually, we're liking the position we're in now. You begging at our feet. The idea that maybe, once you're gone, we can move up the chain. You know, Rocco here is plenty qualified to take your seat. In fact, we might as well make sure you don't make it out to here alive. Rooster looks up at them, irate. His fury fizzles upon spotting the thugs' various nample gut cutler. Gutlery. No, why I can I can make you rich, I <clears throat> Sounds like you two are looking to get hurt. The gangsters look you over. No ink, no suits. You one of them runners? Shit the runner. Don't let him take off with Rooster. He reaches for his weapon. Get him. Rooster. <coughs> Get in cover, Rooster. <coughs> Before you looms a formidable cast iron door, it's locked. Your means of escape, just behind it. You notice a keypad mounted on the wall, but you have no key code. A quick scan reveals a potential weak spot in the door's hinges. You have a feeling you can get through, but it's going to take a while. <coughs> have Goblet assess the keypad. Sheesh, put me on the spot, but why don't you? Okay, okay, I see a 2, 4, 5 and something that feels vaguely like a 9. But I don't know their order. This might take a sec. Cover me, alright? Gobert hunches over the keypad and hastily smashes, smashes its button, testing different combinations. Well.
The Talon bursts out of the Shangri-La, nearly tearing the door from, his, from their hinges. Despite the fleshy lumps that have transformed his face into an unreadable, swollen mess, his rage is clear. At the sight of the Talon, you see Rooster's body relax. His voice cracks. Talon, I'm over here. I've got weapons trained on me. Can't move. Save me. And we'll get out of here. Take this incident straight to the top. They'll herald our survival. Reward us. Through leaking eyes, the Talon homes in on Rooster. You little shit. Dragging me to this restaurant over and over. Making me eat filth. Uh, or watch your stuff. You watch your stuff, your goddamn face full of it. And now, here you are. Turned traitor in blink. Rooster is trembling with fear. Or anger. Or both. He raises a shaky finger and points it at the Talon. You can't speak to me that way. You're beneath me. I'm still a rib pole. And when the trial comes for me, I'll see you flayed for those words. Huh. The, the laugh punches the air. Talon's lips curve into a clumsy smile, eyes gleaming. You won't get shit from the 289s. In fact, if your new allies don't gut you, the triad will. Make sure you don't go squawking to anybody about high-level plans or secrets or whatever. A flea like you won't last the night. Rooster's <coughs> fake bravado melts away. Eyes wide, he looks desperately around him. Trapped like a mouse in a snake's coil. Enemies on each side. His voice is small, pleading. Tell him, Johnny, please. Please help me. It wasn't all bad, right? We had some good runs, you remember? Panic shakes him. I had no choice, Johnny. I was forced to friend her. But if you help me, get me out of here. I can see to it that you're rewarded. Even promoted. How would you like that? Without hesitation, the Talon takes a step forward and spits on the ground. To hell with you, you spineless bit pusher. I'll uh, bet you didn't even put up a fight. Just rolled over and played the captive. Coward. I'm going to enjoy planting a bullet in your soft, worthless skull. He readies his weapon. <laughs> Food poisoning. Two damage. <sighs> Sit your ass down there. stack up there. Oh, one sec.
Okay, let's see here. Overclock. GG. <clears throat> From all horn. Both ways langu languid the uh, top of the water, insulated woods stifle outside noises, as if the chaos just beyond the door prolonged to belong to another world. Its interior is cramped, made smaller by maritime equipment protruding from the walls. 
The scent of sea and mouldering wood dominates your senses, ripened from years of perfunctory cleaning. Finally, a safe place to rest. Rooster uh, flinches at your approach. When he speaks, he tries to sound confident, but his voice cracks. The 289s are gonna jam you up for this. No one's going to cry over you. Worse. Worst you'll get is dead. Worst uh, will get is a finger waggle. But so long as that hand is also holding our Nien, we're in good position. Can you say the same? He flashes Rooster a smile. Things are not looking good for you, Mr. Lowe. Best you stop running that mouse of yours. <coughs> The boat heaves and pitches over the bay as your uh, driver plows through the choppy waters to the drop-off point, leaving the Shangri-La restaurant far behind. Inside, restlessness fills the cabin. You have finished the job, the extraction was a success, and now your client awaits his prize, the triad red pole rooster. Uh, it wasn't easy. It uh, should have been. It, it should have been. It would have been if that damn talent hadn't mangled your plans with his visceral determination. But even a streets forged orc like the Talon could be stricken down. With the Talon dead, your escape from the restaurant to the get getaway boat was made smoother. Well, as smooth as wading through a small army of triad and skirting the HKPF dragnet could be. Sure, the rooster took a few hits, but who knows? With the Talon permanently out of commission, you might earn a few extra in the end from your effort. Or from your client. You took one small fucking hit. Damn it. transient. The gibbering transient wheels to face you. His eyes are bulging out of his skull. He's a young man, probably in his late thirties. But his hair has gone bone white. He reaches toward you with hands hooked into clothes and his entire body begins to tremble. You've seen them. I know it. I can smell it on you. He reaches his hands to his face and claws at his cheeks, his fingernails digging into his flesh. The devils, the ones that are coming and, uh, and the runt that leads the pack. Another transient glance over at you. He got into town yesterday, came in on the same boat that we did, seemed normal enough at the time, but now he's stark raving mad. I'm not mad, his voice raises into a scream, I've seen them, they're coming, they're on their way here now. Calm down, what you saw was just a nightmare, it wasn't real, the devils are real, I know it. His bulging eyes dart from you to the others in the street, spittle flies from his mouth as he speaks, they're right behind me, always behind me driving me like cattle, breathing down my neck. I can smell the stink of their breath. <clears throat> Let me get you to a hospital. You need help. It's too late for that. We're all beyond help now. They're almost here. Tears spill down his cheeks as he sobs piteously. They run in rivulets into the gashes that he tore into his cheeks. They are all coming, all clawing at the gate. She is already slipping through. He seizes up mid-sentence. His eyes roll back into his head and he falls to the pavement. When he hits the ground, he doesn't get up. He isn't breathing. Uh, I think he's dead. Check the man's pulse. You kneel and press your fingers to the fallen man's neck. Nothing. The transient stares down at the fallen man's body. Her brow furrowed. To hell with this place. I'm getting out of here. I know that uh, it's none of my business, but you should do the same. <clears throat> Not me. I have business to attend to. She shrugs. Your call. Best of luck. You enter a trawler to find your crew gathered together, waiting for you. Isabel has her head buried in her PDA. The rest of them stand watching her, trying to be patient. Did someone call a crew meeting? I told you. What's going on? Isabel paces up and back, trying to decide how to begin. I've been doing my homework on Josephine Sang and Sang Mechanical Services. <coughs> You're pacing, so that tells me you found something. Oh yeah, I found something, alright. 
Isabel lifts her PDA to her face and consults her notes. In 2011, Sang Mechanical Services was a D-level company floundering in the shadow end of the Hong Kong corporate pool. That's when Josephine Shu married into the family. Josephine thought big. She convinced, uh, she conceived of a massive project that would catapult TMS into the big time, something she called the Prosperity Program. Prosperity, that's what Raymond was mumbling about. What does any of this have to do, have to do with Raymond? It has nothing whatsoever to do with Raymond Black. It has everything to do with Edward Sang. <coughs> then let me guess, Josephine's husband or son? Son. Duncan jaw drops open. What? No, come on. Raymond Black is actually Ra Edward Sang, the only son of Josephine Sang and her late husband, Breakwater Sang. So our secret foster father, gra foster grandmother is trying to kill us. It looks that way, yeah. Rector chuckles softly to himself. Secret grandmother, what the hell is going on, Isabel? Start from the beginning. Okay, here we go. Once upon a time in the 1900s, the walled city was a dense, densely populated slum. Something like 30,000 people crammed into six and a half acres. Wait, I've heard this story before. It's a shithole. Hell on earth. Yada, yada, yada. That's today's walled city. The second walled city. The first walled city started life well over a hundred years ago and lasted through both world wars and almost through to the awakening. It was torn down in 1994 when the government had finally had enough. It had become such a haven for criminals that the cops would only enter it, on it in large, well-armed groups. Sounds familiar. In 2021, Joseph Tsang, Josephine Tsang proposed a vision for a new type of low-income housing project, this pros prosperity project, a self-contained, low-cost walking neighborhood for the poor. But on a grand scale, the prosperity project would give Hong Kong's poor and the, food and the flood of refugees pouring into the country a place they could call their own, something that felt more permanent than the sprawling tent city that sp spontaneously sprang up after the first world city was demolished. <coughs> she got the grand skate right. It's a giant hellhole. Isabel responds as, a flat, as, f it's as flat as a board. No kidding. The prosperity project would replace the tent city and would be symbolically built on the site of the old world city. The slogan was a place of dignity where prosperity begins. And ends, apparently. The apartments weren't much bigger than the space you'd get in your average coffin motel, but they were built around plazas and marketplaces that contained goods and services catering to the poor. Like drug dealers and prostitutes. This sounds just like the first world city. The government forgot the lessons of the last world city. They loved the idea of containing the refugees and the poor to only a few densely populated blocks. It kept them out of the public's eye. Kept the tourists happy too. Isabel gives Gobbet a flat shut up expression. Gobbet smirks in reply. Securing the walled city, <coughs> city job was the first step towards uh, Tsang becoming what it is today, toward putting Josephine Tsang in the, on the executive council. That doesn't line up. How did she get so powerful by building a slum? It wasn't a slum that made her rich. From what I've uh, read, the walled city job was a disaster. By all accounts, her prosperity project should have landed her in the poorhouse. That wasn't what happened, though. After the walled city went up, TMS landed contract after contract. Huge, lucrative ones. Nobody knows why, and those were the jobs that propelled TMS into the big time. So where's Raymond come into all this? <coughs> Not Raymond, Edward. Edward Chang was in charge of laying the groundwork for the walled city. Excavation and utilities, running in power lines, sewage, that kind of thing. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. Remember that massive grey water leak that flooded the basement back in 48? Uh, when we got back from that camping trip in the Salish, Ray screamed about murder about that. Wu nod, smiling. I'd never seen him so angry. He, so, he sobers. But did Raymond know how to fix it? No. Ray didn't know the first thing about sewer lines. He hired a small army of plumbers, probably paid them double what the job was worth to fix the thing, and it still took almost two months to get the leak under control. And Josephine put him in charge of the utilities. No wonder the Wool City smells like that. I don't think Raymond had anything to do with the utilities in the Wool City. So if this man was not in charge of the utilities for a project, what was he doing down there? I don't know, but Edward Sang disappeared from the public eye shortly after prosperity was completed, around 2031. That's about the time he moved to Seattle, around seven years before he found us. 
But what happened in the Wall City? And what would make Raymond want to go back in there now after all these years? I don't know, but I intend to find out. <coughs> out of town. From Kanye Chang to Dystopia. Out of town. I'm not in Hioi right now, so don't bother coming to see me. We'll talk when I return. Please continue with our business ventures in the meantime. Data retrieval. I hope you're enjoying your newfound success in the shadows. I got another job for you, one that should prove very lucrative indeed. I've been contacted by an employee of the Eastern Tiger Corporation, and he needs you to steal some research data and biological samples from his, uh, his employer. The man's name is Tigas Wright. Until recently, he was a researcher on a genetic engineering project. He was cagey with the details, but I gathered that it centered around phen phenotypic alteration and postnatal genetic enhancement. Unfortunately for Wright, he's got a conscience, stupid man. Luckily for us, he's willing to pay to have his conscience assuaged. <coughs> Wright's project was apparently quite horrible. Experiments on living children. Total disregard for biomedical ethics or safety. And when Wright raised concern, he was taken off the project. Uh, he's decided to step outside the bounds of the law and expose their wrongdoing to the world. His legacy is that his wife and child live in Seoul. Seoul. Not quite the heart of Eastern Tiger's power. Not close enough. He's afraid that if he releases the information himself, they'll be taken prisoner and used as leverage. The idiot should have thought of that before, but that's not our problem. The sample and data are currently on an Eastern Tiger cargo ship. The MV Nalshi, sailing near Hong Kong, on their way to Seoul. The storm slowed the ship down, so you don't have to go right away, but don't take too long. Once you have the data and samples, you're to call Wright. I've attached his number. He'll give you instructions on how he wants the information leaked. When you're ready, let me know. I'll arrange transit with Captain Yomo. He's a local Loho Yova pirate and smuggler. But don't let that put you off. He's as good as they get, and he'll have you on that ship without incident. Take the run. I've let Captain Yomo know you're ready. You can find him down on the end of, of the pier, my partner's on. He'll handle everything from there on out. Good work out there, kid. Here's the money I promised you. The client is fairly pleased with how you handled the situation. Rooster Lou, Rooster Lou has been very contrite and forthcoming, due in no small part to the violence with which you handled the opposition. The client was even willing to overlook the injuries Rooster sustained after hearing that you killed the Talon. Your payment is attached. Okay, that's it for now. Catch you later.